All right. All right, you guys, we are doing a Coach's Corner chat today with Dr. Sam. She's a friend of mine who I've known for a couple of years now, and she's a kettlebell athlete and a physical therapist and specializes in helping people heal their back pain. And she's just an all around awesome person. So she agreed to come on and talk with us today about pelvic floor uh, health and how it ties into back pain and some other issues that uh, we may have or may not have, but just learning a little bit more about the pelvic floor, which I think is kind of a hot topic right now. And um, Sam, are you doing a program right now to help people with like pelvic floor issues? Do you want to talk about that? I am. Yeah, I have a postpartum program going right now. So specifically for moms um, who want to stop peeing their pants with exercise. But there's a lot more to it. So I'm excited. There's a lot like we think when you hear pelvic floor, right? We automatically assume like, oh, well, I haven't had kids, so I don't have pelvic floor issues. But there's so many other things that like we might not think about, um, especially for us who like train really hard that um, some little tweaks that we can make to optimize the function of our pelvic floor. Yeah. And in our group, we have right now, like live, we have some people that have not had kids and some people that have, and then we also have men in the program and we have people in their like thirties up to their fifties. I'm trying to remember if we have anyone in, in their sixties, but yeah, like all kind of varieties of ages. Um, so speaking to those people about pelvic floor, like I think of pelvic floor as, um, your like deep core muscles all the way down to like your vagina and butthole. Um, is that about right? Or what is your pelvic floor? <laughs> Yeah, totally. And I'm so bummed. I have a really cool pelvic model that, but it's in my clinic. So I wish I had like a visual for you guys, but um, yeah. So the pelvic floor muscles, we actually have three layers of them. So there's like the outer layer that, uh, that is more like vaginal muscles that attach to our clitoris for female anatomy and control sexual function. Um, and then like we have a second layer that controls more like bowel bladder stuff. And then uh, the third layer is like these kind of like big sling muscles that provide a lot of stability to our pelvis. But you're right, Rachel, they work with our deep core. So it's like part of that whole deep core system. Um, but they have uh, like they do other things besides just like stabilize like our core muscles do. Um, okay, so how did you start kind of connecting all the dots with like pelvic floor stuff and back pain and leaking? Was it just because people were coming to you with these issues or how did it all kind of, how did this become something that you were like more interested in? It actually started with my own personal story. I, I haven't had kids yet. This was like five, six years ago. Um, and I was having a lot of back pain. I'd been dealing it with it for like three years. I was having like nerve pain. I couldn't work out. I could barely walk like five minutes without nerve pain. And I tried like everything like PT, chiropractor, stuff like that. And finally, one day I realized, well, I started leaking. Like I started not being able to hold my pee in when I was like trying to make it to the bathroom and sex, like intercourse started to become really uncomfortable. And so I'm like, wait a minute in PT school, we had like one lecture on pelvic floor stuff. So it really didn't dawn on me until I started having some more of these obvious symptoms like leaking. And so I went to a pelvic floor PT and it like, cleared my nerve symptoms. It made my back feel so much better. And so it made me want to like dive more into learning more and like continuing education courses. And then it just started like putting all the pieces together of like, because when we think about back pain, especially in PT school, we always think like, oh, you must need to just strengthen your core. But there's like the way that our pelvic floor muscles attach with our hip joints and our pelvis and our spine. Like it's such a complicated, intricate system. There's just so much more there than just like doing Kegels or like strengthening our core, just kind of like we've all been, all been taught. And, and I've learned that like affected that too, like sexual health and 
um, emotional health of like being able to ride in the car and not feel like you have to pull over every hour to <laughs> pee on the side of the road on a road trip. So for you, was it like your pelvic floor muscles were weak or strong, or was it a combination of a bunch of different things? Was it that simple as you needed to strengthen your pelvic floor? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So yeah. And I feel like that's where a lot of the, um, misconception comes is we think like if we have any of those symptoms, like leaking or pain with intercourse, or even like for females using, um, tampons or for guys, erectile dysfunction, like there's so constipation, right? There's so many different things. And so we think like, oh, we must just need to strengthen, but especially for us as kettlebell athletes who like, we generate so much tension through our hips, like with swings, right? All that power that's automatically generating a lot of tension and our pelvic floor muscles too. So for a lot of us, we actually need to learn to relax those muscles instead of strengthening even more. And so that was like the biggest thing. So for me personally, that was my issue. Cause I just walk around like my butt clenched all the time, like holding my breath. That's just how I am like an anxious person. Um, but a lot of us too, like I said, when we're doing like heavy lifts, we have to generate a lot of tension through those muscles. And so that's number one, but also if we're kind of just in that pattern or in that habit of like always squeezing our butt, that's going to create too much tension in those pelvic floor muscles, which can create any of those symptoms that I just talked about. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I'm having a big aha moment, um, for the fact that it took me like two and a half hours to birth my daughter. And then at the end I was begging them to like use a vacuum because I just like couldn't. And I, I personally feel like because of exercise, I was probably so tight in my pelvic floor that it was really hard for me to like relax enough to like get through that process without a ton of problems. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I always like, I always use our bicep muscle as an example, right? Like if we just walked around with our bicep shortened all day long, and then we go and try to like, I don't know, like pick something up, right. That muscle is like already at its max tension. Like it literally cannot produce any more force. And so it's the same thing with our pelvic floor muscles. If we're walking around, like gripping our butt or just naturally have so much tension when we go to contract it even more, like if you have leaking with exercise, for example, like when you jump or sneeze or laugh really hard and those muscles need to contract to hold your pee. And there's like physically nowhere else for them to go. They physically cannot contract anymore. So they're not going to be able to do their job. So how are you working with people? Is it like a do this breathing exercise? Whoops. What happened? Are we back? Sorry. My computer did something super weird. Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> how are you working with people? Problems. Is it just like, uh, some breathing exercises? Is it like breathing exercises coupled with like core movements? Like, what do you do? So it really depends on the person, but I would say like generally for, for your, um, your membership, for your clients, like I said, for us as kettlebell athletes, if you're having any symptoms, like, um, we didn't even talk about like constipation could be a symptom of a too tight pelvic floor, or we talked a little bit about sexual health, but like, if you notice decrease intensity of your orgasm, or if you can orgasm, or like I mentioned in men, erectile dysfunction, um, hit or back pain that like, doesn't go away. That's really chronic. I would say as a generalization, it's probably safe to say that it's because of a too tight pelvic floor. So, um, I would start with some relaxation exercises and we, I know some of you are at work, but we could totally try some Rachel, if you want to be the Guinea pig, I can like yep. walk you through a few, and then you guys can have the recording to try them, um, try them. Um, maybe you can incorporate a map into your cool down after your, after your yeah. workouts. That would be amazing. I still like send people the, um, stretching and mobility workout that you did with us like a year ago. That was for 
like back health. I feel like I took so much away from that. And I still use a lot of those exercises that we did like for thoracic spine and hip openers and like stretching to the side. I mean, I use all that stuff all the time. So I feel like whatever you give us is gold. And, um, but I mean, how, how like I teach people to brace their core and you can tell me like, is this good? Is this bad? Is this like a very small piece of the puzzle is <clears throat> when I went to kettlebell training, they talk about like bracing your core and thinking of your core as like a canister, basically like all of your torso. So we want to think about um, like a tube and, or like a can of soda, but just like a larger can of soda. And you want that can of soda not to be like sucked in and you don't want it to be like pushed out, but you just want to be tight. It's just kind of like tension all throughout your core. And when you're say getting ready for a squat, for instance, if you have your kettlebell, you're standing up, you're bracing your core in a way that, and I'm, as I say this, I'm also squeezing my butt. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're bracing your core in a way that if someone was going to come up and karate chop you right in the gut, you're ready for that. You're staying tight. You're firm. Your stomach muscles are like tight. And kind of, if you were going to like flick a soda can that's full of soda, you know how it doesn't really give and it kind of like hurts your finger. That's how you want your core to be when you're getting ready to squat, when you're at the top of a swing, when you're, you know, setting up for, for instance, like your deadlift or your bent over row, like that, the sensation that we want to feel with our six pack muscles, but then also with those like deeper core muscles. So that's the explanation and training that I have received about like bracing your core. Um, but I know there's so much more to it than that. And yeah, that's where I, I kind of, that's where my education sort of like, uh, ends and where I think you could probably fill in like a ton of gaps. No, that's awesome. I would just add, so there's a couple of things I would say about that. One is, um, three things actually. One is for, for women who have had kids, if they have leaking with exercise, sometimes that break, like if you're going really heavy and you've got that brace, right. And you, I think the way you teach is how I learned to kind of with that, like breath at the bottom, especially of a squat mm -hmm. for women who have had kids, the concern often is pressure management. So if you're generating a lot of pressure and tension in your core and also adding load down, sometimes we need to change the breathing pattern so that, because sometimes that breath puts even more pressure down on the pelvic floor. Yeah, exactly. So that could be an issue, but I would say if you're not having any leaking issues, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad movement for your pelvic floor. The only thing I would say that we need to think about is like you said, like you were squeezing your butt to prepare for the movement. <laughs> And, and we need that. Like when you're lifting heavy and you're swinging at heavy kettlebells, we have to generate all that tension. Like you said, through the core of the karate chop to be able to, to stabilize our torso and prepare our body for those heavy movements. But when you're standing there right now, you don't need all that tension. So like, yeah. When you're I just need to hold my body up. I don't need to be like squeezing my butt. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that's more of where that like awareness piece comes in. So when we start to notice our habits, like I mentioned for me, I, it, I still practice every single day, reminding myself to relax my butt. Like I do not need to be squeezing my butt right now, just sitting here talking to you. Um, and so practicing some of those like relaxation exercises after your workouts, just to kind of train your brain, like, okay, we're done generating all this tension. Let's relax. We can kind of go back to resting mode and then we can generate more tension when we need to is, is something that I see can be a game changer, especially for like hip pain, back pain stuff. Okay, cool. You want to take me through like some of those relaxation techniques or anything like sure. that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I did want to say one more thing though. Um, 
like one example you mentioned was the bent over row. And I see a lot of people have back pain in that bent over position. And so one thing that can be really helpful, and we'll go through these relaxation exercises, but like when you, when you go into that hinge position, you're like, what I see a lot is people like squeeze, right? To generate. And then you're still squeezing as you hinge, but really our butt muscles and pelvic floor muscles need to be able to relax in order for our hip joint to really get that hinge. So if you are having pain with like deadlifts or those bent over motions, um, maybe play around with like, can you release that tension in your butt and your pelvic floor as you hinge back <clears throat> and then generate the tension as you're standing or as you're swinging and see if that makes a difference. Do you follow Stacy Shadler on Instagram? Yeah. Yeah. So she talks a lot about, I think what you're mentioning, which is like, you have to be able to like release muscles yep. in order to then contract and get them stronger. Like if you're just walking around with a clenched butt or a clenched pelvic floor all the time, like that's not helpful to yep. actually getting stronger and like building a butt. So you have to be able to like let it go to then watch it grow. It's She says something that's like kind of catchy like that. And it really yeah. reminded me of kind of the things that she talks about a lot. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Let's try a couple, let's try a couple things. And really it kind of comes down to, um, breathing because our pelvic floor muscles work with our diaphragm muscle. Um, and so really just kind of stimulating that, that pattern can be super helpful. So, um, let's even, let's just start in child's pose. My beautiful model. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what's child's pose? I do it six times a day, but what is <laughs> so like even in that position, can you just let your butt relax? Can you let your pelvic floor relax? And then as you take a big breath in, like think about filling your belly and filling into your back. And as you breathe in, can you feel your pelvic floor muscles relax even more? And then exhale and just let everything go. And then as you take a big breath in and like, even if you're at work and you're sitting here, even just practicing, can you fill your belly with air as you take a breath in and like feel your butt muscles relax, feel your pelvic floor mu muscles relax down to your chair and then exhale. They, and then when you exhale, you'll feel them just kind of gently re-engage. You don't have to like contract really hard because they'll naturally just Kind of, I think of like a trampoline, they'll just naturally kind of bounce back up. Um, but when you inhale, they relax and then exhale, they come back up. Can you feel that reach? Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great position th to practice that I feel people can, can really feel it in. Um, the other one is figure four stretch. So you can flip onto your back <clears throat> and part of our pelvic floor muscles attach into our deep hip joint. So, um, is this yeah, the figure four? Yeah, exactly. You want leg straight or leg bent? You can bend it and just kind of like okay. hold it into your chest. Yeah. Okay. So like even in this position, so still taking a big diaphragmatic breath. So filling up your belly. And as you do that, see if you can feel your pelvic floor and butt muscles relax even more. When I'm breathing, am I supposed to be filling up like a certain part of my is it like my ribs first and then my belly and then my pelvic floor and then exit out the reverse way? Um, ideally, yes, but it's not like, I'm not super picky about that. Um, I don't think it's a huge deal. Honestly, I think as long as you feel like you can expand and the reason I cue belly breath is because I think it's easier for people to, to picture that, but ideally your ribs are expanding out to the side and front to back because they are a 360 degree, um, system. Space. Yeah, exactly. But I say, as long as you're breathing and the, and your diaphragm is expanding and you feel your belly expanding a little bit, and you can feel your pelvic floor muscles relax at the same time, then you're, then you're good. Can you feel it? We, yeah. And we do this stretch in like the cool down stretch. So maybe a way to elevate that 
would be to take like three belly breaths and really just focus on the expansion of your ribs, your belly, coming all the way down to your pelvic floor, feeling that relaxation of the muscles and then yeah, and, and we call it down training and it's really just like teaching your brain. Okay, you can relax that tension now. We're done with the workout. We're good. We can just walk around with like a normal amount of tension instead of that like excess tension that we just had to generate in the workout. Yeah, nice. And then the other one is um, that I recommend is happy baby. Do you know that yoga pose? Yeah, yeah. so here. Yeah. And you could just one do way. one leg at a time if for people, like if that's it's better right and their hips, yeah, their flexibility. Um, but I find that's a really great one to open the hip joint. And it's just kind of easier to feel too. Like when you breathe in, you can really yeah. feel the movement of your pelvic floor relaxing in that position. Totally. And then you would just switch. Yeah. Is there a recommended amount of like breaths or is it like four seconds in and hold it and four seconds out do you have a recommendation for like the cadence I would say like maybe take five breaths in each direct or each position or and honestly again it's more about just kind of that like retraining your brain and reminding your brain that it's you can you can release that tension now that it's safe to release that um and it's also a nice way to just kind of like bring your nervous system down after the a super intense kettlebell workout. Yeah. When you are like wanting to brace and wanting to have tension, is the like squeezing of the butt, the thing that I was like, as I'm doing this, I feel my butt cheeks are squeezed. Is that like an automatic thing that I'm doing and that we're all probably doing that's helping us like get our pelvic floor on board with what the rest of our core muscles are doing. Is that helpful in any way or should we like not do that? That's a good question. I would say it depends on your, um, it depends on just like how your pelvic floor is functioning. So if you do have any of those symptoms I mentioned, like leaking, pain with intercourse, um, chronic hip or back pain, or you just like now after hearing this, you're like, oh yeah, like I just clench my butt all the time. My pelvic floor muscles are probably tight and you're having pain with movements. Then I would say we might need to like spend some time retraining how you're engaging your pelvic floor. So like squeezing your butt may not automatically engage your pelvic floor muscles if there's a disconnect in how your brain is communicating with those muscles. Does that make sense? Yeah. But like for someone who doesn't have any symptoms and you're like squeezing your butt, you're bracing, you're ready for your movement, it's likely that your pelvic floor is doing what it needs to do. For like for you, um, how long did it take for you to recover or start to like put those pieces together? Was it like a couple sessions? Was it a couple months? Do you still mm -hmm. do like tune up kind of training or breath work to keep everything working properly? Yeah. I'm trying to remember timeline. I mean, I dealt with back pain for so long and I still have like flare ups every once in a while. And I will say when I do have flare-ups, like I've just learned, I know it's like my hips are tight. My thoracic spine is tight. I'm holding too much tension. I'm stressed out. Like I know all my factors. So, so I can like quickly bring myself out of it and recover. Um, but I do like part of my warm-up is always hip and thoracic mobility. And part of my cool down is always like some of those stretches I just told you, just because I know and can feel like when I don't care for that, my symptoms come on. Like I have pain, like I can't take out a tampon without a ton of pain or like I feel an urge to pee all the time. So I kind of have all these reminders that I personally, like that's just how my body is. That's my habit. So I need to actively be working on it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Like for the, the program that you're doing, is it, 
an eight week program? Is it a four week program? Like, how are you structuring the amount of time that people can work on this stuff? Oh yeah. So, and so those are for, for women who have had kids and are having pelvic floor dysfunction. So for eight weeks, we're going through like these first few weeks. It's all about this. What we're talking about is like learning how to relax so that you can engage for a stronger contraction. Cause the goal of the program is to help them exercise without peeing their pants. So mm -hmm. we need to really build pelvic floor um, strength. But in order to do that, like we talked about, you have to relax first. So it's like, that's the first few weeks. And then the next five weeks is going to be, it's more about like coordination. So learning how to properly engage your pelvic floor. Um, cause a lot of us do when we try and engage our pelvic floor, we just end up squeezing our butt. Like it's, it's harder for a lot of us with female anatomy to engage vaginal muscles as well. Um, and so we're going to work on like, how do you do that properly? And then how do you start to integrate that into different movements that we would see in workouts that just build overall strength? So it's really about like training your brain to first engage pelvic floor, stabilize there while you're doing these other things. Very cool. Yeah. Love it. Do you guys have any questions? Those of you who are, um, hanging out, listening, any questions? Do you have any um, specific advice for uh, women over 70? Mm, in what way? Well, because my mom has like serious pelvic floor issues. So I was kind of hoping maybe there was something there for her that she could try. Yeah. Yeah. And like hormones. Is it like incontinence? Is it like that type of stuff? No, it's actual pain, like pelvic floor pain. Yeah. Um, pelvic floor physical therapy would be my biggest recommendation. Um, let me pull something up real quick. There's a search tool. Is she in California? Yeah, she is. She's in she prison. Is, yeah. Um, let me pull this up for you. So, um, <laughs> I would start with pelvic floor physical therapy because they can really mm -hmm. do a specific, um, assessment for her that includes internal assessment. So, um, that really gives you the best information. Like they can assess where's the pain coming from. Is it triggered by some of these specific muscles or is it maybe a referral from like an organ or something can sometimes refer pain into the pelvis area or pelvic floor muscles. Um, so that would be my biggest recommendation to start. Um, Herman and Wallace is a, really great. They provide a lot of continuing education courses. So here's a link. I'll drop it in the chat. So you can look up a provider in your area. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the information, Sam. I know a few people that they've actually had surgery. And I really wish they would have had more of this like knowledge before, because I think, I don't know, I just feel like it might, might not have been like really the best alternative for them. But um, if they would have known some of had more research and done something and had taken some classes or something with you, they would have, you know, maybe fixed the situation instead of just opting for surgery. Yeah, I was, do you know what the surgery was for? Um, I Is know like my prolapse. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I know my cousin, she had four children and she was just starting to experience a lot of um, leaking. Um, and she just, I don't know, I, her doctor just, I don't think they really did anything like as far as like trying to like correct it. They just were like, all right, I think we're going to do surgery now. And that was it. Um, so I think like, yeah, she, I think she would have been open to doing some kind of like, um, at least trying to like, correct it herself before just opting for surgery. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, you know, sometimes surgery is needed. Like Rachel said, there's some mm -hmm. like situations of prolapse or, um, like some women with diastasis recti who have pretty severe or like that can lead to umbilical hernias, you know, things like that. There are some definitely situations that surgery is just needed. Um, but you're, but you're totally right. Like I, I wish that every first referral would be to pelvic floor PT to at least try that first 
before jumping straight into surgery. We still got a lot of work to do in our medical system. <laughs> um, if I, so when I think of like pelvic floor PT, I'm like a little bit freaked out that they're going to be like, uh, like touching all up inside me. Is that part of it? Yeah, yeah, it is, but okay. it's not, so just yeah. Get over and it. I wish I had my pelvis so I could like take you through my whole little spiel, but, um, and, and what I tell my patients is it's not like you're not in stirrups. There's no speculum. Um, it's really just like we use our, our first digit. So we of course put gloves on and then remember how I mentioned there's three layers of pelvic floor muscles. So we enter vaginally typically, um, unless you're having a lot more of like bowel symptoms, then you would get an anal assessment, but most symptoms can be resolved or assessed vaginally. So the first layer is literally just to like first knuckle. So it's like barely inserting into your vaginal opening second layers to second knuckle, third layers to third knuckle. And so it's really just kind of like a gentle assessment. Like you just kind of use our finger. We feel if there's any tenderness or trigger points or tension. And then, and then internally is where we can really feel like, can you contract? How strong is your contraction? Are you able to relax? How are you, you know, like endurance stuff too. Like how long can you hold that contraction? Um, which can be an issue, especially for postpartum women. But so there's just so much information and I know it like sounds really scary, but once you, once you experience, it's not as bad as it sounds. I'm sure we've all done much worse. I know I have <laughs> through all of the doctor's appointments I went to, to get pregnant and have a baby and all that. I mean, how do it totally. works? So totally. All right. And I will say Anything? for men too, um, for men, like pelvic floor PT for men is a thing as well. There's like for prostate issues too. Um, there's a lot of support that's offered for them as well. Oh, that's really good to know. Yeah. Anything else? Um, anybody wants to add or Sam, anything else you want to add? I don't think so, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, how can people reach you? What's the best way to get in touch with you if people have more questions or they want to get more information about any of this stuff? Oh yeah. Um, I can give you my email. I'll type it in the chat. It's hello at Dr. Sam Chernock.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm on Instagram at Dr. Sam Chernock. Or Rachel, if they like, if they put them in your WhatsApp chat, if you have follow-up questions, feel free to shoot them over. I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, perfect. I'm just saving your email so I can put it in the chat or not in the chat, but in our um, WhatsApp. Did I spell it right? Oh, yeah. Okay. We're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. All right, my friend. Thank you so much for chatting with us. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. And Thank you guys for hopping on live and watching and recording. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. See you soon. I hope. Bye.